I remember standing on a street corner in Moscow talking to a white-haired elderly Russian Baptist pastor, a man whose father and the fathers of all the men in his community when they were little were taken away by Stalin and sent to Siberia. He said, go back to America and tell the church, if you're not prepared to suffer for your faith, then your faith is worthless. Well, what did he mean by that? Through every generation of Christianity, even today in countries like Egypt and the Muslim world and in China, Christians are suffering for their faith. It is vital that we get this eyewitness testimony on camera so people in our country will not forget history, that they'll know history and they'll learn from history so that we can build the resistance now while we still have the freedom to do so. Eventually, this whole system of lies will fall apart, but it will take longer for it to fall apart if people are afraid to stand up for the truth, if people are afraid to have the courage to resist, to say, you do to me whatever you can, I will not live by lies. What's up? Hey, everybody. Uh, hello, hello, hello. Welcome. I am RJ Moeller. I'm the producer I'm of Isaiah the Live Not Movie. By Lies. Oh, please. I, I, I should have gone right to you, Zay. My bad. Well, Isaiah no, Smallman. No, no. You, your, your bio is too important, RJ. You keep going. Well, no, I'm, I'm just here to set the table for the real talent because we have an amazing... Can I say episode? I don't know what uh, amazing live stream tonight. We've got some very special guests, but no, let's start with the most important director extraordinaire. Uh, we are now live. We are raising money. Uh, we're $400,000 in people are supporting us. We love it. But uh, Isaiah Smallman, my, my good friend, our director in Chattanooga, Tennessee, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Yeah. I'm excited to see how things are going. It's been, it's been super exciting to, feel the love and feel the support that people are bringing our way. And we're excited to keep this train rolling. Absolutely. And our good friend, Rod Dreher, who will be joining us in uh, some later segments with our guests who we will uh, announce and get to here shortly. Uh, we just first and foremost want to say thank you to everyone who's already invested. We are open to investment. Uh, you can go to angel.com slash live as in live not by lies. Um, we are raising money. We want to make a documentary series. Uh, we want to go to Eastern Europe. We want to travel the world. We want to capture stories of people who have survived persecution and totalitarian regimes and their message to us today of what it was like for them and what we can be on the lookout uh, as we go about our lives, hopefully not living by lies as we do it. Um, but yes, we it, it's been an absolute blast. It's been a journey. Uh, we won't bore you with all the details tonight. We've shared some of it in previous live streams, but we've been working on this for a while. And so to get to this point, Isaiah, I know for me, I, I can speak for all of us to some degree, but I want you to chime in. Like, how does it feel? This thing's real. People are giving their hard-earned money. They're supporting us. They're investing in this thing, knowing that all this project's been through to get this thing here. Rod writing the book, us getting the rights, developing it, bringing you aboard. How are you feeling tonight? I feel great. I feel a mix of relief and anticipation. Um, obviously, we are really close to our minimum, but um, you know, we we need to keep going way past that to really be able to tell these stories as well as we really want to. And that's um, that's an exciting prospect. I mean, we're you know we're very early in our live round, obviously, but um, yeah, it's it's a daunting challenge to continue to look at all the need that we have to, to really be able to crush this the way that we want to. And yet again, the support already has been amazing. Um, and then, yeah, there's kind of the creative side of me that's uh, thinking, all right, I hope we can pull this off. But, you know, I look around yeah. and I'm like, the story is so great. Uh, the team is so great. The, um, the opportunity to expand on what's already there 
um, is obviously enormous. And, and there's just so much, there's so much history here to explore. I actually was, um, just recently where well, I'm, I'm Eastern Orthodox and I was just in a class, um, learning more about kind of our history. And I mean, there's just so many periods throughout the history of the last, you know, 2000 years of the church where people have people of, you know, faith, um, have really had to, uh, fight for the right to worship the way they want. This is not, you know, we, we still, as we mentioned, we kind of left off with this last time we, you know, we, we are in an incredibly privileged position to have the opportunity still to have freedom to pursue God the way that we want to pursue God. That's a big deal that we still have that. And I think I'm increasingly convicted that we need to protect that. We need to protect it at all costs because, um, even if that, you know, makes me uncomfortable with the way someone else might be doing it, that's okay. Ultimately the, 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 the job of us here is to, to live honestly. And so anyway, I've been meditating on that a lot and just thinking, how do we tell that story? How do we tell it in the most compelling way that is welcoming yeah. to people and, um, really compelling. So. No, very well said and appreciate you sharing all of that. So, uh, a key component in all of this beyond, uh, the folks that lived this, survived this, that told their story to Rod, Rod writing it in the form of a best-selling book, uh, and us now wanting to tell it in documentary series form, uh, multiple episodes, which we're raising those funds at angel.com slash live. Uh, Angel Studios is a key part of why we're here. That's why we're literally, they were kind enough, um, uh, you know, there's a whole process that it goes through, and many of you who are supporters understand that. Um, but we're so grateful to be partnered here with Angel Studios. Um, uh, all the great work they've done over, over recent years is incredible. And so we're honored to be a part of that team in any small way. And actually, I've been told we have a little video from the CEO of Angel, uh, Neil Harmon. So why don't we cue that, play that, and then we're going to get to two phenomenal guests that we'll tease uh, further and, and give bios to. But a little message from Neil, CEO of Angel now. Hello, Angel fans and Angel Guild members. Welcome. You decide what comes next at Angel Studios. And the Angel Guild has given Live Not By Lies a very high Angel Guild score, moving this project forward to the crowdfunding stage. We want to congratulate the filmmakers, and we look forward to the response of the Guild and audience members in supporting these true stories, making it out to the world. You can visit angel.com slash live to support Live Not By Lies today. Thank you so much. Wow, Excellent. well that was nice of Neil. Uh, great guy, we were, nice. we were privileged to, to meet him and, and the whole team when we went out to Provo last year uh, when we first started um, putting this project together. So again, to be here, it's a huge honor and thrill, but we're going to talk a little bit more throughout tonight's uh, live stream and we'll, we'll come back at the end and, and talk more of where we go from here and the help we need. Um, but we have two amazing guests, friends of uh, Mr. Dreher's, friends of ours, people whose work and uh, writings and thoughts, public sentiments, have, have influenced Rod and Rod's influenced them. And so we wanted, as we go about the, the next couple of weeks here of raising money and beyond, be able to bring friends of, of the projects who can speak to some of these things. And so tonight we're going to have two guys. And, and uh, in a second here, Zay, I want you to introduce our first guest, who will be Dr. Carl Truman, and we'll give his bio in a second. And then after that, we're also going to have an interview with our good friend, syndicated uh, national radio show host, Dennis Prager, uh, founder of PragerU. I'm sure many of you uh, uh, frequent PragerU's video selection, which is incredible. So we'll give, we'll break down each of those guys. But first up is Dr. Truman. So Zay, introduce us to him and let's get into that interview. Yeah, absolutely. So Dr. Truman is professor of biblical and religious studies at Grove City College in Grove City, Pennsylvania. And he earned his MA in classics from the University of Cambridge. PhD in church history from the University of Aberdeen, and he's the author and uh, of uh, over a dozen books, uh, author and editor of over a dozen books, and has recently written a really terrific book uh, called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. And it's just a really great um, diagnostic of, of what we're looking around and seeing. I think a lot of us are notice, noticing that things feel a little off and um as you can tell this guy's not only very well educated but um a great 
accomplished writer. And this book is really, it's, it's, uh, it's not only good, but it seems to be really connecting with audiences. It sold quite a, quite a large number of copies. And so we were really excited to have a conversation with him and, um, and, and, you know, have Rod kind of pick his brain about some important stuff. So we're going to jump right into that. In the meantime, I'll just remind you, they keep flashing this QR code here. If you have not yet invested, please seriously consider doing it. We are trying to make this project. We want to make it uh, really well. We want to make something that's going to be extremely high quality and incredibly compelling um, entertainment while also really pushing this mission forward. So if you have not yet invested, please seriously consider doing so. We're going to make you proud. It's going to be an exciting prospect um, for uh, an exciting process for all of us. So uh, come along the journey. Let's do it. In the meantime, yeah, we're going to jump into Dr. Carl Truman. Let's do it. We hope with this movie that uh, the Live Not By Lies documentary that we're going to make, that that will accelerate people's consciousness and not just their awareness that this is happening, but also spurs them to do something about it. Do, um, do you think that this film project stands to do some good in that for, for the church in that respect? Yeah, I mean, I think just in general, the film medium is very helpful. I was doing an interview yesterday with uh, somebody who's produced uh, an excellent video series on sexuality and gender for use uh, by families. And uh, he made the comment in that, he said, you know, I've written books on this, but kids watch movies. They don't read books, they watch movies. And I think if we're wanting to win the rising generation, and, and we really need to, you know, you and me, Rod, we're in our 50s. We're not going to be around for that much longer. Hey, we now. really need to make sure that the... <laughs> I need to make sure my granddaughter's generation is, is aware of this. So I think, first of all, doing it in a video idiom is, is the way to do it at this point. Uh, and secondly, I, I think that the message is very important. And we all know that narratives and testimonies are powerful. And your book, you know, the most powerful moments in your book are the interviews you do with the people who live through communism. I can only imagine that those testimonies will be exponentially more powerful oh. when people actually see the faces. I always struck in that Solzhenitsyn's first volume of the Gulag Archipelago. There's, there's a couple of photos in there of people, and they're nobodies. I think they get one mention in the text. But what he's doing is he's putting faces to a couple of the people among the millions who were shot by the NKVD or the KGB during the, the Stalinist era. And I think a, a movie, even more than a book, puts a face to the story. And I think that's crucially important and very, very powerful. And the thing you get, and I've shared this with my colleagues, Isaiah Smallman, the director of the film, and R.J. Muller, uh, producer, I've told them that there's nothing like sitting with these people, these heroes, many of whom went to prison for the faith, and seeing the light come out of their faces. These are men and women who have every right to be bitter, but they're not, and they're not bitter because they're Christians. The, the story that I tell when I, I give talks about Live Not By Lies that, that gets everybody on the edge of their seat is the story in the book about Alexander Ogorodnikov, a Russian Christian. He became a Christian in the 1970s as a young man, and he was one of the last people the Soviets sent to the Gulag before the end of the Soviet Union. And um, he was visited in his cell when his faith was waning by an actual angel, and God showed him a series of visions. Now, it's powerful, the narrative in and of itself, but I, I heard it from Ogorodnikov, sitting with him in a hotel in Moscow, uh, he's in his 70s now, with tears running down the uh, cheek, the side of his face is paralyzed from the beatings he took in the very cell where he had the vision. That's the sort of thing that we can bring to, uh, to the church and to anybody who watches this film, because this is not just about Christians. I mean, it's, it's not just for Christians to watch. Anybody who uh, believes in liberty is going to be drawn to this film. Uh, but to see the faces of these heroes, it's just remarkable. And not only that, I, I was talking the other night to, uh, I had dinner with Jordan Peterson here in Budapest, where I'm, I am, and Jordan said, we have to get these testimonies on camera while these men and women are still alive. They're old. One of them has already died uh, since I interviewed her. And uh, so that's part of the urgency, too, of this project. Yeah, I think, you know, if the stories are not told, the stories will die. Um, it, I think it's, again, a quotation. I think it's from 1984. Uh, 
the truth was erased, the erasure was forgotten, the lie became truth. So I think it is critical that we, you know, and the same applies, of course, to the Holocaust. You know, the very powerful Holocaust testimonies. Uh, we need to get records of this human suffering and also of uh, uh, human resilience in the face of this suffering mm -hmm. uh, to be both a warning and an inspiration to a rising generation. That's right. Uh, colleagues, do you have anything you'd like to ask Dr. Truman? Yeah, I'd love to chime in. I, I would love to hear a brief outline of kind of the argument that you make as to why sex and sexuality is such an important wedge in this broader movement. Because I, I will admit that I think that was one of those things that for a long time as a younger guy, I thought I was in the camp of, well, whatever happens over there happens over there. And it's it. I don't think I understood until recently why it becomes a, a collective movement, whether we want it to or not. And it's it, it's not as easy to say there's them and us or there's that yeah. person who believes that in this. But it, it actually changes the fabric of what all of us believe. But could you could you outline your argument for that a little bit? Yeah, just I mean, just very briefly. So the way most certainly most Christians think about sex or didn't to reason. we think about it in terms of behavior, because, of course, that's how the Bible describes it. Uh, um, yeah, the Bible talks about certain sexual acts as being legitimate and certain sexual acts as being illegitimate, regardless of the attitude of the people involved. So and I, that's the intuitive way, I think, that most Christians think about sex. That's not the way that Western culture conceptualizes sex today. And one of the points I make in, in my work on the sexual revolution is the sexual revolution is not actually about expanding the number of acceptable sexual behaviors there are. It involves a fundamental transformation in what we understand sex is. Sex ceases to be an activity and becomes an identity. And there are intellectual roots for that. Um, Sigmund Freud being most obvious. There's a technological component because for that to be the case, you know, sex has to be cheap and safe and easy. So contraception, antibiotics, and essay. But essentially, sex becomes identity in the 20th century or becomes a key part of our identity. And that's intrinsically plausible because you know, we know that the erotic is a very powerful drive. The reason I say to the students, the reason why we watch, read the Iliad and understand it today is it's basically the plot of every American soap opera out there every lunchtime, only with magnificent great heroes rather than just beautiful people hanging around. But the plot speaks to us because the erotic is powerful, and we do know that that's a, a key part of who we are. But of course, once sex becomes identity, it must inevitably become political because then the sexual acts that are or are not legitimate actually track back to the kind of people who are, you know, the kind of people we're allowed to be. It's not you know, what you do, it becomes who you are. And in that context, you know, there's a sense in which one can all sympathize with the case, well, what, ha what if the two guys sharing a house next door, I mean, maybe they're just two guys sharing a house, or maybe they're two gay guys having sexual relations every night. What difference does it make to me if they keep their lawn you know, neatly trimmed and they don't have loud parties late at night. But on the other hand, for them, of course, if their sex is their identity, then there's a certain imperative for you to recognize that, uh, both personally and, of course, as it's played out at, at the level of society as well. And that's where, you know, the sexual identity politics really begins to bite in that once identity is involved, tolerance is not enough. Because tolerance says, hey, you can do what you want behind closed curtains, closed doors, as long as it doesn't interfere with me. But I'm still going to regard you as a second class person. And that you said in your I, recent First Things column that the church, those in the church who adhere to traditional biblical sexual norms, will not even not simply be tolerated anymore. There's going to be no. worse persecution, right? Yeah, because you, are, you, you know, it's essentially today's equivalent of racism. You know, no, nobody thinks that racism is an acceptable religious or intellectual position to hold. Everybody thinks it's bigotry. It's nasty, hateful bigotry. And I think once sex moves into identity, then the same kind of grammar and syntax apply to sex as well. And that's why we're in the position we're in. You know, right. I, you, you mentioned at one point recently, well, not, not recently in your book, but um, the idea that there's a transition that happens of sort of the the absence of affirmation becomes actively sort of yeah. aggressive that yeah that's an that's a transition that i think is key and i never understood that before but it's becoming more obvious because 
as you pointed out, you know, the attaching phobia to anything is now this catch all. And it's like, if you aren't, you know, if you aren't willing to date, you know, someone who's different than, you know, trans or any other yeah. thing that makes you transphobic or if yeah. you're, you know, it's like, well, that's not really the same thing, I, you know, but I think that's an interesting evolution that's taken place. Yeah, I'm just finishing a chapter of a book that I'm writing on exactly that issue. And I, again, I think it's complicated. Uh, there's a strong technological component to this because I think one of the things that social media has done is it's, it's really abolished privacy. It's, it's abolished that distinction between public life and private life. And when you have uh, expressive individualism, this idea that you have to, you know, the real you is when you, you're able to act out on your inner desires. When you have that in a context where there is no private life anymore, then I think an interesting social consequence happens. And that becomes, if you're not performing on certain things, that looks suspicious. So, you know, if you're not putting the Black Lives Matter symbol on your social media account, that would seem to indicate that you're opposed to Black Lives Matter because there is no private you behind the public persona where you could be in favour of Black Lives Matter. So I think that the, the technological destruction of the private sphere, combined with this notion of what it means to be human that we have to perform is a very profound significance in the chapter. Don't steal this phrase, Rod. I'm copywriting this phrase. The, the title of uh, the, the, the last section of this chapter is The Signal is the Virtue. And I'm trying to make the point that we talk about virtue signaling, but actually there's no virtue behind it. There's no stable virtue behind the signal. It's actually the signal. It's actually the performance that constitutes the virtue today. And the problem is, as uh, Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis have found out this week, you, you know, the, the, the traditional virtue framework behind it, hey, a man is presumed innocent until proven guilty, and so you can write a character reference for him, that's constantly changing now. The only constant, the only moral constant in our world is that you have to perform. The content of that performance is constantly shifting, leading to these you know, horrific games of gotcha and lives ruined because, hey, I happened three years ago to use language that was perfectly acceptable then, and there's still a record of that on, that inter on the internet now. And this is why the people who grew up under communism, but who came to the West, began to see this about eight years ago, when what we now call yeah. wokeness began to rise, because they had lived through a version of this. Yeah. And they're trying it's, to- It's the equivalent of Harvel's grocer. You exactly, know, you tell have. that story. Well, it's, he, it's his thought experiment about you know, the, the shopkeeper in Prague who's required to put up a sort of Workers of the World Unite poster in, in his shop window. He doesn't believe it. The authorities know he doesn't believe it. Nobody believes he believes it. But he still has to do it because, to use a modeling, silence is violence. And that's what I think about, you know, when you think about a lot of online, you know, nobody thinks Benedict Cumberbatch is a racist because he refers to colored people rather than people of color. Nobody thinks he's really repented of his non-existent racism when he issues the apology. But he has to issue the apology. We're having to, to use Rod, you know, the phrase that Rod uh, uh, Barrett took from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, we have to live, we're living by lies at this point. We have to pretend that this world of performance is actually real and not some kind of simulacrum. Carl Truman, thank you so much for being with us today. I um, appreciate your work and it offers a, an incisive view as to why things are the way they are in our culture today um, and why every Christian needs to read Strange New World. And, uh, and, and absorb its lesson because these, the, the things you're working on, the things that I'm working on, we're talking about the same thing, but from different angles, which is about how the church is going to survive and thrive in a post-Christian era. Yeah. And without, see, the dogs are at the door. You can, <laughs> yes. you can hear them. <laughs> the running dogs of capitalism. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be the Stalinist phrase? <laughs> There you have it. Well, <laughs> thank you so much, Carl, for, uh, for coming on to support us. And, um, and uh, we hope we can see you maybe when we start filming. Sounds good. And we're back. Thanks again, Dr. Dr. Truman, for uh, joining us. Uh, such a great perspective that he brings to the table, I think. Yeah, it's... 
his book, uh, Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, which I know we're here not to promote other people's works. We're here to talk about our project, angel.com slash live. Please go tell your friends, share it, rah, rah. But um, it is one of the most interesting books you will ever read. Hands on, he's a brilliant mind. Agree, disagree, whatever. Like I just, the, the ethos of our project, of what Rod's trying to do, of, of the fight that I believe we are in, people who, who love freedom and freedom of thought is, yeah, to, to tell the truth as best we know it and then engage with others who might disagree. And again, we don't have to get into a sidetrack because I want to get to our next guest here in a second. But um, I, I just, it's, it's, it's an honor. It is, it's a privilege. We'll say it every time we, we interact with you fans uh, to get to be around people like this, ideas like this. This stuff's important. And these guys um, are some of the best in the world, the best minds on this, this topic of freedom of thought, freedom of speech, totalitarian instinct. Um, so, yeah, really appreciate yeah. that. Uh, we gave you part of the interview. The full interview is going to be released later this week. And so uh, stay uh, and we'll, we'll plug socials and all of that, but be following uh, Angel Studios and their social media, uh, uh, various platforms. Uh, and you're going to get the full interview with Rod, with Dr. Carl Truman, with Isaiah, and then my dogs barking in the background, as you heard, uh, Bear and Bella. Shout out to them. Right um, on cue. Yeah, so that was great. And now we, uh, we're we going to tee up another interview that we did that we were lucky enough to have. Our good friend, uh, Dennis Prager, who I, I assume if you're watching this, you know who Dennis Prager is. You've heard of Prager you, But he is a nationally syndicated talk show host. He's heard on more than 400 stations, to say nothing of all the podcasts and fireside chats and things that he does. He is the founder of Prager University, PragerU.com the most viewed conservative video site in the world with 1 billion views a year. And more than half of those are by people under the age of 35. Uh, fan, fascinating stuff, educational. Uh, he's a New York Times bestseller. He's a theologian, a, a, a Jewish scholar. The Rational Bible uh, is, is a, a multi-volume series that he's doing exploring uh, uh, the Torah. Uh, he conducts symphony orchestras. He's traveled to under uh, over 130 countries. He's lectured on all the con you know, all the world's continents. He, and he's an expert specifically. The reason we wanted to have him on is his area of expertise. The thing that he studied in graduate school at Columbia is communism and the history of communism and Russian history and Jewish history. So we had Dennis on uh, to talk with us about all of these subjects and more. And again, we're gonna play you a truncated version of that interview now. And then later this week, be following, again, social medias, following Dennis's social medias, we'll be plugging that. Um, but yeah, any Isaiah, anything to add? Should we just get right to it? No, I, I just love Dennis and I think it's gonna be a real treat for people to get to kind of hear his perspective on this. Also, I had no idea that he's a conductor, which is really cool. He's just uh, full of all sorts Renaissance of surprises. Man. It's truly. He's also one of my favorite contributors in the new uh, uh, on uh, Daily Wire, the Exodus series. Um, his insights on the book of Exodus were just incredible. So, yeah, I think he's just he's just a really uh, an incredible talent. So. So yeah, thank you to Dennis. Again, truncated interview. We'll come back. We'll close things out. If you have questions, be submitting those throughout this episode. And uh, Michael, let's roll it. Let's get to Dennis Prager. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think that one of the reasons Live Not By Lies, the book, did so well is it came out during that first year of COVID. And it made COVID made people in this country see what was possible and you talk about the the uh the lack of courage i, I remember in prague and this is in the book I, a woman named camilla bendova she and her husband her late husband Václav, were the only religious believers they were catholics in the inner circle around Václav havel and the the uh dissident leadership and i i asked her i said was it difficult for you and your husband as faithful catholics to be around all these hippies you know who are sleeping with each other's wives and so forth she said, no, Rod, not at all, because when you're fighting totalitarianism, the rarest quality to find in anybody is courage. Almost all of our fellow Christians kept their heads down and conformed because they didn't want trouble. But my husband and I knew that we couldn't do that. We couldn't stand before God and do that. And we couldn't look in the faces of our children and be that way. So we looked around for the people who were courageous. And it turned out it was these hippies. 
So uh, I took a lesson from that for my book, and I hope we can bring this to this film project, which is look for allies, not necessarily in your church or in your synagogue, but look wherever you find people who are brave, who will not conform, will not live by lies. You will love this following uh, statement then. I have studied rescuers of Jews in the Holocaust all of my life because I think goodness is at least as big a riddle as evil. So I've tried to figure out what type of person did this. And I, I it kills me. I remember where I read the book, but I, I couldn't afford it. I was so poor uh, in my early 20s. But I, I was visiting my brother at Harvard Medical School, so I was at the Harvard Coop, the bookstore. And I, there was a book on rescuers uh, of Jews, non-Jewish rescuers of Jews in the Holocaust. They gave four four characteristics. I don't remember three of them. One blew my mind. And they said, the people who studied these people, if you were considered an eccentric prior to the war, you were far more likely to be a rescuer of Jews during the war. And since then, I have always admired eccentrics just what your friends were describing to you. And uh, our fellow Christians and Jews have not been eccentric enough in, in, in a moral sense, obviously. Mm -hmm. I don't care you know, if they have handlebar mustaches, uh, but although that might be one of the criteria. But the, I have to say, in all the depressing things, nothing was as depressing as the, uh, the, oh, the instinctive, obedience of churches and synagogues to irrational, this is key, irrational secular authority. If we can't look to religious institutions for, for liberty, then we are really in bad shape. You know, Dennis, I dedicated this book, Live Not By Lies, to the memory of a Croatian Jesuit priest who escaped the Nazis. He was doing underground work against the Nazis in Zagreb. He escaped them when he found out they were coming for him, went to Bratislava in Slovakia, began teaching at a Catholic university, and told his students in 1943, the good news is the Germans are going to lose this war, but the bad news is the Soviets are going to be ruling this country when it's over, and the first thing they're going to do is persecute the church. So he spent the next few years he had when they were at liberty, to prepare the underground church. So when the Iron Curtain fell, the Slovak Catholics who were who listened to him, and they didn't all listen to them. Some of the bishops said, oh, Father, you're scaring people. Stop talking about this. But those who listened to Father Kolakovich, they had a strong uh, system and network in place to help each other through the persecution. Why do you think it's important to learn the lessons from people like that right here, right now, in the, in the 21st century. I'm laughing because you're sort of re repeating Santayana's warning, right? Those who don't learn from history are, are doomed to repeat it. One of my recent columns is, I don't remember the exact title, but essentially, American students know nothing about evil. And uh, by the way, that that's a key to understanding the crisis in the West. Evil has not been taught. How many Harvard will take the most prestigious university? How many students at Harvard can identify the Gulag Archipelago? Hmm. Do you know 45% of Americans under, I think, 35 cannot identify Auschwitz? I mean, you're, you're a moral idiot if you don't know what Auschwitz was. You're a semi-moral idiot if you don't know what Gulag was. Forget Pol Pot. I mean, Pol Pot. I, they they might they probably think it's pottery. Oh oh, do you, oh I bought a Pol Pot the other day for my kitchen. <laughs> the, the, this the the ignorance of evil is staggering, and it's deliberate. One of the reasons it's deliberate is because it was nearly all communist outside of Hitler. All the genocide of the 20th century was left wing. And I might add, big government. And I might add, secular. <laughs> well, so why would they teach evil? 
the more evil you know, the less likely you are to be a leftist. Yeah. Why do you think it's important for us to go to the former Soviet bloc and get these people, these men and women who stood up to communism and some of whom went to prison for it? Why is it important for us to get them on film and bring them before the American public now? Well, there are a few answers. One, one is just a, a moral one. We owe it to good people to memorialize what they did. I, I, I mean, to me, that that's that's basic decency. Secondly, we, we owe it to the memory of those who died doing this. You know, Jews have been obsessed with finding every name of the six million Jews Hitler killed. You know. Uh, and I, I happen to support that view that everyone is infinitely precious. Do you know the left attacks Prager U constantly for our anti-communism, which is a giveaway about the left, because mm -hmm. they still believe Pardon Amisa Ghost, there are no enemies on the left. And, and uh, I, I, they they mock my video, why don't people hate communism as much as Nazism, which is a perfectly morally legitimate question. Well, so, and, and that's, yeah, that's one of the reasons, Dennis, that this book means a lot to me. I and mean, I'm 56 years old. I remember the the last years of the Cold War. You could not, I, I couldn't possibly have imagined back in you know, the late 80s, early 90s, when this was all ending, that within a single generation, it would be almost entirely forgotten by people who don't, who didn't live through it. But that's where we are today. Oh, I would go further. I don't think it was known while it was happening. It, it, I was sent by Israel when I was 21 years old in, in the height of the Cold War. I was sent in the Soviet Union because I knew Russian and Hebrew. So I was sent for a month to smuggle in religious items and smuggle out names of Jews who wanted to leave. And when I, I came home to the United States, I began lecturing. I was 21 years old. And I remember by year two, I would say to audiences, when I describe to you Soviet totalitarianism, and I'm not saying this to hurt any of your feelings, of course, but basically it doesn't sound real to you. Uh, and I, I remember saying um, the American was as incapable of understanding totalitarianism as the Soviet citizen was incapable of understanding liberty. When I would speak to a Soviet citizen about America being free, they would almost invariably say, uh, this is not freedom, this is anarchy. Sure. So they, they, they didn't understand, how could they? How could an American understand that before you talked to a Westerner, you looked around to see who was listening. But you know what? This happened to me for uh, years during the Trump administration. A a almost any airport I go to, people come over for a selfie or just to say something. And this shook me up. People would come over to me at airports, look around. Mm -hmm. And then say, I support uh, Trump. And I thought, wow, the last time people looked around before they spoke to me was in the Soviet Union. Yeah. I, I'd love to jump in really quick. Um, Dennis, you mentioned people don't, we're almost incapable of understanding. What What do you think practically? I mean, we're making a series, obviously, and to some extent, our goal is to help people understand. But w how can we do that better? What would be your advice to achieve that goal um, to the fullest? I have found it effective to sort of read an audience's mind, so that way I could. I could remove obstacles to getting my message across. So in effect, almost saying, I recognize that because you've lived, Westerners have lived in freedom, much of what you are about to hear or see is almost surreal, but it is not surreal. 
this happened. And the whole point is, it could happen again anywhere. They're taking away land from farmers in the Netherlands, one of the great meat producing countries of Europe. They will induce hunger, but they're doing it in this case in the name of climate change. People are prepared to lose liberty in the name of, and I, I take credit for this, I said 20 years ago on my show regularly, health uber alles. Instead of Deutschland uber alles, Germany above all, we have the new one, safety above all. That in the name of safety, all rights can be removed. And that, Dennis, is why I have told people, if you're thinking, if your idea of totalitarianism is Orwell's 1984, which was based on the Soviet model, that's out of date. This is a totalitarianism that's uh, much more like Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, which right. was a totalitarianism that people chose because it promised to make their lives easy without friction, without suffering. You had sex, you had drugs to make you feel good, you had entertainment everywhere. The world controller for Europe in the novel said, described it as Christianity without tears. And the one dissident, John the Savage in the novel, you may recall, is brought before the world controller and the world controller doesn't want to torture him. He just wants to say, why don't you want to be with us? And John the Savage says, because I want, he said, you're too comfortable here. He said, I want God. I want love. I want poetry. I want sin. He wants in other words, to be a human being. And he understands that to, that to accept this, this uh, uh, the, the so-called gift of having no suffering at all would mean to give up his humanity. And he's not willing to do it. That, I think, is at the core of this new totalitarianism. People will surrender their liberties for the sake of convenience, for the sake of health and safety and well-being. That's correct. That... But it, it, the irony is, it's not even true. They're not getting safety and well-being out of this. Keeping kids out of school didn't keep them safe. It ruined their educational abilities. We are still paying the price. So it's a double whammy. They didn't give up liberty for the sake of well-being. They gave up well-being and liberty. Hmm. Do you think we can pull this out as a country, as a society, or are we doomed to be slowly uh, uh, boiled like the frog in the pot? Your question had the key word, can. We can. I'm glad you didn't ask me if I'm optimistic or pessimistic. By the way, I have no use for either. Optimists don't fight and pessimists don't fight. The optimists think things will turn out great, and the pessimists thinks things will turn out lousy, so neither fights. Uh, the guys who uh, attacked Normandy Beach were not optimists. You do what you have to do, whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. We have to fight. Otherwise, by the way, and this I do believe, every grave at Normandy Beach is pointless. We don't have, we, we have to fight, but we don't have to face Nazi machine guns. We, we have to face New York Times editorials. Uh, and if if we're not even prepared to face that, or or being uh, d uh, whatever the word is from my cousin's Facebook page, mm -hmm. I mean if, if that holds you back from fighting for liberty, we don't deserve liberty. Do you know, Dennis? Every single man or woman I interviewed in the former Soviet bloc did not expect to live to see the end of communism. They fought and they resisted because it was the right thing to do. That's right. Well said. And that's the kind of spirit that we, as we make this film, want to convey to the American people. You and I as Americans can talk about this till we're blue in the face. But when you get an old man who was beaten in prison and his face is partially paralyzed from the beatings he took to talk about what that was like um, in Russia, that's incredible. People see the, the 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 faces. And look, these are faces of people who are at peace. They're at peace because they had faith. They knew that their suffering meant something. 
if only in the eyes of God. And I think this is something very powerful that Americans aren't used to because we've had it very easy, relatively speaking, in terms of religious liberty. Those days I fear are over, but that doesn't mean our faith stops. We just have to learn how to suffer as the Jews of uh, Soviet Russia did, as well as the faithful Christians. That's exactly right. Here's an interesting philosophical question right up your alley, Rob. Do we know anyone until they're tested? I don't have a perfect answer. By the way, do we know ourselves until we're tested? All I can say is this is a time of testing. And if you don't fight right now the totalitarian threat, which is virtually entirely from the left, not from liberals, liberals have failed to test, but they are not the evil that left is. Liberals are not totalitarians. They vote for totalitarians. For totalitarians. You know, there's a um, Re Reverend Richard Vermbrand was a Romanian Lutheran pastor who went through the Romanian Gulag, and he said in one of his books he wrote when he uh, was ransomed to the West by I think President Ford, he said that everybody likes to think that they would pass the test, you know, <laughs> but you don't ever really know until the secret police are at your door. Um, but so what we have to do is build ourselves up every single day by refusing to live by lies, by deepening our prayer lives. I, I, I write in the book about a man, uh, a Catholic from uh, Slovakia, Sylvester Kirchmeri, who was a leader in the underground church, a layman. And he knew that sooner or later, the secret police were going to take him in and put him in prison. So what he did was memorize scripture and deepen his prayer life. So be prepared for that. He didn't want to go to prison, but when they pulled him off the street and put him in a cell in 1952, he had made himself ready for that horrible day. And this is the kind of thing that I, I want to get across to Americans, especially the young people who would watch this film. It's not to be afraid of the future, but you know this could happen to us. There's nothing special about being American, as Solzhenitsyn knew. Uh, now, we simply have to prepare ourselves so we are not caught unawares. Solzhenitsyn's great speech in America was given at Harvard. Harvard would not invite Solzhenitsyn today. No, of course they wouldn't. Yeah. Well, then, Dennis, I uh, go ahead, uh, RJ. You want to? No, say I was something? just. I was going to say. I know we uh, are short on time here, and wanted to say thank you to Dennis. Uh, this has been a tremendous conversation. We're so excited about this project. But any parting words, Rod, before we sign off? No, I just want to say, Dennis, I'm very glad to be on your side, standing shoulder to shoulder against this new totalitarianism. And I thank you for for your for your help, for your wise words. And um, I, I hope that uh, you'll be willing to talk to us when we show up with the cameras to talk about the Soviet experience and what you know from your studies about the seriousness of the current moment and what it has to do with with the past. Because as you said, those who are not uh, willing, those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. We don't want to repeat the Soviet experiment here in America, and we are not doomed to. We have the freedom to resist it, to build a resistance, but it's not going to build itself. We, it requires us to act. And it, it begins with acknowledging the ease with which evil can win. That's what people need to understand. Well, I, I love standing shoulder to shoulder with you. So it's it's mutual and happy, happy to do a part two. I'll just end with a great uh, Soviet dissident joke, which is applicable to America today and what the left is doing to our history with the 1619 Project, for example. The greatest humor I ever encountered was Soviet dissident humor. It was dark and hilarious. One of their jokes was, in the Soviet Union, the future is known. It's the past, which is always changing. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your time. We appreciate it. My joy, really. Thank Good luck. Goodbye, Dennis. Thank God you. Bless. Thank Thanks, you. Rod. Okay. I think you might be muted, RJ. 
That that is such a great zinger to end on, by the way. <laughs> what a great joke. So perfect. Yeah, what a great conversation. Uh, Dennis is always a treat. He's always been very kind. He he cares about these things. And I guess I would just say really briefly before we uh, get to some Q and A, so if you have a few questions lined up and and sign off for the night, um, like if things. I've just started to embrace something in my own life. If something bothers me that I, I hear from a commentator or read in an article or you know, on the news, a politician, start examining just internally why that is and, and looking into it yourself and want, again, wanting to engage with other people. That For me, that's one of the reasons I, I wanted to make this project is to show hmm. that people who lived under totalitarian uh, regimes they don't have the ability to even have these public conversations. So I know not everyone watching this might love Dennis Prager or Carl Truman or Rod Dreher or whatever, but like, I never thought I'd live in a world where I, I really am interested in what Russell Brand has to say. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm sure he and I don't agree on a lot of things, but uh, uh, strange times makes for strange bedfellows and strange friends. And we do need to stand with, Anyone who loves freedom, anyone who loves freedom of thought, people that want to have these kind of conversations. So, again, thank you to Angel Studios for having us, for, for having this project. We are live, angel.com slash live, where you can invest and you can be a part of this project. Uh, two great interviews, again, both of which will be released this week in their entirety. So you can see the whole conversation. Stay tuned for that. But, um, but yeah, if you don't have any other thoughts on the Prager interview, you want to get to some Q&A and wrap things up tonight? Yeah, I think that sounds great. Let's hit, a, hit our first question. All right. All right. John um, Peterson says, do you have any projections of when you hope to come out with the first part? RJ, you, do you have any projections? I mean, it's it, to some degree, uh, you know, we are chomping at the bit. We want to make this thing. We want to get it funded. So as, as quickly as we can hit certain benchmarks, and our first one is 500K, which is the minimum we need to reach before we move on to others. And we'll unpack all of this in, in further live streams in the coming weeks. But for now, I would just say, yeah, we, we wanna move quickly. So the quicker we get funded, uh, uh, production, we're already looking at where we wanna travel, who we wanna interview, putting together lists. You know, Zay, you can speak to this briefly too. But uh, I would say, we are absolutely raring to go here. And this is part of the process. It's an important part. It's how we get funded. It's how we pay for travel and hire cinematographers and all the fun stuff that goes in to making any sort of film or film series. But, um, uh, you know, it's, you always have to be careful of projecting too much because things change, timelines and all of that. But all I can say for me and say, you close us out on this question, but like, we're ready to go. We want to go make this thing and we want to bring it to you as soon as humanly possible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'd say the same thing. I think at this point we are, I don't, I don't know, frankly, waiting on all of you to decide, um, how, how, and when we get to make this. And so we're, we are very much chomping at the bit and trying to be patient, uh, doing all of the prep and research and everything that we possibly can do without actually getting out there and, and, um, and, and shooting stuff. But, um, yeah, we feel very confidently that, uh, once we get the ball rolling, we're going to be in a great position to put something out. I would say, obviously we can't s promise this. I mean, you know, we, we think we can definitely, if, if this funding round goes well, if we get in a really pos good position to start producing things soon, I think, you know, next year sometime late next year is a very likely, um, sta standing, uh, from our current standpoint, something we, we could look at, but yeah, we can't promise it because we don't know exactly how all this funding is going to wrap up. And, um, you know, we're, we're excited to, we're, we're, we're very excited to see how all that goes. I'll just leave. Yeah. It. We're on this journey. We're, we're on this journey with you, the fans. I mean, we're obviously yeah. getting peaks behind the curtain, but we're in it with you and we're going to be as transparent as we can be and share, you know, all the steps of the process. And right now it is all about funding. So if you or anybody, you know, has, a hundred dollars or more that they want to put into this thing. Yeah. Do it, be a part of it. And, uh, as our friend Dennis Prager often says, let's do good and do well together. Mm. Yeah. One thing I'll add is interesting. I, I don't know who, who, who's out there listening. Um, but I'll throw this out there. You know, we need 
every type of investor to make this thing happen. We need every single person who can throw a hundred dollars or more at this to show up and you know begin to help us tell the story. We we need everybody from there to people who can bring significant amounts of of capital to the table as well, and they may even be industrial, uh, in not industrial, but um, institutional style investors. You know, this is a this is the kind of thing that. Um, we would, you know, it's, it's a real investment vehicle. And obviously we're not going to get into too many of the details of exactly what that looks like in this live stream. You can go to the page on angel.com slash live and see all of the inner workings of the way that the corporation is set up. But yeah, we, you know, we're inviting anyone and everyone who wants to come to the table to partner with us. And that includes institutions who invest in this kind of thing. So if you know anybody who, um, you know, works at that sort of an organization, please put it in front of them too. You know, we need everybody to band together, small and large. It's a group effort. Yeah, and last thing I'll say, and then let's go to the next question, Mike, here in one sec, but there are perks. There are levels of, of crowdfunding. If you give certain amounts, if you want to be a producer on this project, if you want to be a part of the team, there are certain levels and that's just standard in the industry. You know, people invest certain amounts of money and they get certain credits and, uh, so go, you know, look on the page, angel.com slash live, scroll down and you can look at different levels and different perks and you can get messages from Rod. I think one of them is my secret uh, barbecue rub recipe that was volunteered uh, by our friend David and happy to, to share that. But no, we, we want this to be a communal effort. It has to be. And to Isaiah's point, if you've got someone in your life that, that can be a part of this in a bigger way, please send them the link, tell them about it, and we'd love to have them aboard. The I'll just take a second to highlight the top level perk. I have committed, if anyone gives, uh, not gives, invests, to around in the ballpark of $2.5 million. I can't remember the exact number that we landed on. I will either make a short film about the most embarrassing lie you ever told. A custom short film. I'll write it. I'm going to direct it. I will deliver it to you or I will get a tattoo of your face somewhere on my body. I have a number of <laughs> tattoos already. I am committed to this. I'm putting it out there. If you do it, I'll do it. So meet me there. I'll see you out there. Let's go. That could close that. That maxes us out. If, if you're listening right now and you want me to get a tattoo of your face somewhere on my body, we could close this round right now. Hit me up. Gosh, Take me on. I, I dare you. I'd love to see it. All right, let's get to it. another question. I really would too. All right, Catherine Stevens, is it going to be a multi-season show or is it just going to be a certain number of episodes in a docu-series? Uh, great question. I'll say a quick word and then Isaiah, you chime in as always. But, um, you know, to some degree, it's asking like, how long is a piece of string? When it comes to filmmaking, documentaries, anything, when you have a story like this that's so personal for us, we care so deeply, and sadly, people who have surf suffered under persecution of totalitarian uh, governments, it's not exclusive to one region of the world or time. I mean, there's so much that can be delved into. We have set our sights on Rod's book, the study of Eastern Europe in particular, primarily highlighting. Uh, but no, we have dreams that if, if this thing goes well, there there could be many more stories uh, to tell and highlight and, and feature, but I would say, what do you, what do you think of that? Yeah. Um, I think that's a great way to put it. There is an, well, tragically a, a nearly unlimited amount of source material that we could dive into and, and, and an incredible, I mean, you know, uh, Dennis mentioned Paul Potts, um, you know, there are parts of the world, uh, that have been dealing with this, that many of us don't think about really at all. And, it would be a real shame to never have those stories told on a broader level. Um, I think we really have an opportunity here to start again. Yeah. Like you said, with Rod's book. Um, but gosh, we would love to make this a multi-season um, opportunity. And, and again, a lot of that depends on uh, how well we can make this, this first season. Um, and you know, how many people show up and decide to, to get behind it when it's out. So we're calling on all of you to, to, to continue to, um, you know, to, to show up and to, to partner with us. You know, I just wanted to call out one comment that was just passed along to me, um, from, uh, Karen P. She says such a great conversation. You guys have inspired me to invest more. We need these films. 
We need inspiration and courage. We need each other. May God bless this venture. You know, thank you so much and so many other great wow. comments and, and, and involvement from the, from the crowd, but um, really great stuff. And, you know, we're just so grateful uh, to be, um, yeah, to be surrounded by so many people who are, who are excited for us, who are investing their dollars, who are giving us their time, you know, and, and, and their prayers and by, uh, watching this. So yeah, just wanted to call out that great comment. And, and again, please, yeah, tell people, you know, um, they're not going to regret it. It's a great, it's a great project. So thank you. I, I think we should, I think we should wrap up the episode. I, I don't, I, it doesn't get better than that comment. Karen, thank you so much. That made my night and, uh, you know, we care about this deeply. Rod does. Friends of the project, supporters, people that have been with us uh, over the past year as we've built this thing up to get ready for nights like tonight. So, yeah, that thank you. We really appreciate that. And we're just trying to do our best here to honor these stories. They're not ours, but on some level they are because it is all of us and it could happen anywhere. And it is happening in lots of different places and lots of different, lots of different forms. So um, I think we should just end there. Zay, why don't you tell people yeah. where they should go, where they can find you. Let's say goodnight and let people get on their way. But again, Karen, thank you so much. That really, uh, that made my night. Yeah, absolutely. So once again, um, you can find us at angel.com slash live. That's really the best place to go. That has everything you need. If you want to share this project with somebody, send them there. If you want to revisit it and reconsider investing, if you haven't already, go there. Everything is there. Everything you need to know. Um, you can find me at Zay Smallman on Twitter. Uh, Rod is Rod Dreher, I believe. And um, yeah, you know, come back next week. We're going to hopefully have uh, at least one very exciting guest. We're still working on getting all the iron, uh, details ironed out. But um, stick with us. How many more are we doing? We've only got a... Sorry I to interrupt. Two I was more? Tell the... Yeah, we're going to do two more live streams during this round of investment yes. crowdfunding. Yes. So we're going to yeah. have some more guests. We're going to have more conversations if you enjoyed tonight. And again, thank you so much, Karen. Uh, we will be releasing, I'll say it again, both of those interviews in their entirety later this week. We're, we're lining up other great guests. Uh, fingers crossed week. We won't say the name in case it doesn't happen. But if it does, you guys are going to be very happy. Um, and yeah, so follow us we. here. Yeah, so, so we'll... So will everybody involved <laughs> here. Um, but no, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for, for watching. Share this. Share all of this with your friends. Tell everybody what we're up to. That's the only way this happens is, is word of mouth uh, and through good people like you uh, tuning in tonight. So for Isaiah Smallman, I'm RJ Moeller, the whole team from, from Mr. Dreher. Uh, use the hashtag. Live not by lies. I forgot to mention that. Mm -hmm. Start using that on all your social media posts. But thank you. God bless. We'll be back next week. Thank you, everybody. I remember standing on a street corner in Moscow talking to a white-haired elderly Russian Baptist pastor, a man whose father and the fathers of all the men in his community when they were little were taken away by Stalin and sent to Siberia. He said, go back to America and tell the church, if you're not prepared to suffer for your faith, then your faith is worthless. Well, what did he mean by that? Through every generation of Christianity, even today in countries like Egypt, in the Muslim world and in China, Christians are suffering for their faith. It is vital that we get this eyewitness testimony on camera so people in our country will not forget history, that they'll know history and they'll learn from history so that we can build the resistance now while we still have the freedom to do so. Eventually, this whole system of lies will fall apart, but it will take longer for it to fall apart if people are afraid to stand up for the truth, if people are afraid to have the courage to resist, to say, you do to me whatever you can, I will not live by lies.